Okay, good evening and um, welcome. Um, just before we start the uh, main business of the evening, I'd like to introduce uh, an LSE student, Pablo, who's going to tell you very briefly about the Halt Prize and how you can take part. Pablo. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Pablo from uh, Campus Director of Halt Prize at LSE. Halt Prize is the largest competition of social entrepreneurship. Uh, students from all over the world, from more than a thousand universities, will participate uh, to pitch their idea at the United Nations and win one million dollars in seed funding. It's a great opportunity for any of you who's interested in social entrepreneurship and want to launch their own company. So here at Halpers LSE, we're going to help you form a team, and then we're going to select the team that will represent LSE in the international competition. So uh, we're going to have an event this Thursday at UCL where you can meet the previous winners uh, of last year. And you can find all the information in our Facebook page. Uh, we're going to be outside handing flyers if you want to talk to us. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks. Pablo. Thank you. Um, and if anybody wants to get some more information, there are flyers. Uh, yeah. or, you can, or you can come talk, talk to us at the Marshall Institute. Right. Um, before we start, I just want to kind of take the temperature of the room. Um, hands up, um, who knows about blockchain? So we've got some experts in the room. We've got at least <laughs> one expert in the room. Okay, hands up, who knows what ICO stands for? It's a diminishing number. Okay, someone's just, just remembered. Um, hands up, who knows that there's a difference between Bitcoin and blockchain? Okay, so, so nice. we, we have a kind of 50% informed um, audience. Um, we're very lucky um, tonight to have Tay, who's arrived from the Netherlands um, this morning, um, and who is involved in, I think, an extraordinary experiment in the use of blockchain technology for public benefit. And you can see why we at the Marshall Institute and at the LSC are interested in these emerging technologies. This conversation has been going on for a decade or more. Most of the applications have been in financial services, essentially in things like um, uh, foreign exchange, where contracts are exchanged and things are, um, value is moved around and efficiency can be taken out. This conversation is now starting in our world of social impact and um, uh, humanitarian uh, support. Um, and we're very fortunate um, tonight to have someone who has lived through a great deal of what he will describe for us. The plan for the evening is that Tay will tell us his life story, as it were, and how that's resulted in his business called Tycon, um, uh, and then we will ask, I will ask him a couple of questions on your behalf, and then I will ask you to ask him questions. Okay, we have to finish at eight, so we don't have much uh, time, so I will stop now and say how touched I am to yeah. have you here. Thank we you. met at the Founders Forum yeah. um, about six months ago, um, where Tay absolutely captivated uh, room of some of the smartest and I have to say um, uh, most world weary people. So we're very lucky to have you. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Thank you. Thanks. Stop. Nice. <laughs> so, good evening everyone and uh, let's see, there's one more guest. Thank you, Stefan, for the introduction and uh, actually. It was a dream for me to come to LSE since I was five years old, watching Mr. Bean and the Mini Pooper and looking at the city of London from the small television. But this dream, soon as I was growing up, I realized it is almost impossible to happen. And even staying in the Netherlands, I never ever thought that I can come to London three countries in the world I dream of visiting London, the US, and Canada. So now, London, this is my second time here. Why is because as a child, I was born in Kuwait, and during the 1990, the Gulf War erupted, 
a neighboring country invades uh, Kuwait, and the birth registries got destroyed there. Birth registries are centralized. It's birth certificates, marriage certificates, death certificates, saved in one place. The flames took everything out, and we fled to, to Lebanon. So I grew up without the birth certificate. And since there was no copies, no backup, no digital files, I couldn't get another one. So every time I apply at the embassy for a visa, they ask for this birth certificate, and my application gets rejected. Time passes by, I get a job in Dubai, and from Dubai, I was recruited to come to the Netherlands. Now, as I'm growing up, I'm getting credentials. I'm getting my education certificate, I'm getting my residency in Lebanon, I'm getting my university degrees, so the embassies are trusting more and more who I am. And it ended up in the Netherlands. But being born in Kuwait does not mean I carry the Kuwaiti nationality. That means, that doesn't mean my father has an oil well, or we are shareholders in Shell, or we drive Lamborghinis in Shoreditch. My father is Syrian, and I carry the Syrian nationality. This was my curse for almost 30 years, until my work contract in the Netherlands was not renewed in 2014. 2014 is the year where the Syrian war was at its climax, and the immigration services asked me to go back to where I come from. I told them I cannot. I live in the Netherlands now. And I cannot go back to Syria. I've never been in Syria. So if you recall my journey, Kuwait, Lebanon, Dubai, Netherlands, I never lived there in Syria. It's a shame. I've never visited Aleppo. I don't know Palimera. I visited my grandma in Damascus for a few weekends in 25 years, but that's what Syria is, is for me. Now, that curse turned into a blessing because now I am a refugee. And as a refugee, doors open for you. People want to hear your story. People want to hear how did I travel to the Netherlands. I say, hey, I'm living in The Hague. I took a train <laughs> to the immigration center. And they laugh. But another blessing that, that happened in my life was in 2012, I was lazy, watching TV, National Geographic, a program about money. And as my passion from a young kid to come to LSE and study economics, I always followed these programs about money, the history of money, how money is created, currencies and economics. And at the end of the history of money on National Geographic, the, the last 30 seconds of this program, they mentioned the new digital money, Bitcoin. And I was thinking, hey, I can make money at my own home. Perfect. It took me six months to understand what is Bitcoin. There was nothing on Google. You Google Bitcoin, nothing happens. There were no YouTube videos. There was no MEMS even on, on Bitcoin. So after six months, I connected my first miner and I saw, I slept in the morning, I saw some currencies in a digital portemonnaie or a digital wallet. And they were worth 30 euros. A few weeks later, these 30 euros became 50 euros. I said, wow. That's a good investment. Let me cash them out. I can buy myself a pair of jeans. A few weeks later, I mine more coins. And now I have 100 euros. And I said to myself, wow, let me get myself some Bitcoin socks. <laughs> and this is how the, my interaction with Bitcoin came. To be honest, I never believed it will even cross 1,000. I remember in one week, I exchanged 7,000 coins and I spent them. I saved a little bit, not for 
the future because I never believed that it can even grow past 500. And I was looking at one of my Facebook memories today. I was so happy that Bitcoin is at 330 euros on a day like today in 2015, three years ago. So what I took with me to the refugee camp was this knowledge and the wallet with few coins on it. That time it was 600 euros. In the camp, they give you fixed meals. In the morning, three slices of bread with two slices of cheese, the small jam and butter that they distribute them in airplanes on your flight. For lunch, it was a boiled egg, one boiled egg and a cup of soup. And then for dinner, half-baked rice with all the vegetables they can find in the Netherlands in one plate. For the first day, it was okay. For the next day, it was okay. But for three weeks, I said, no, I'm not going to eat that food anymore. I went to the internet. There's a website called thaisbezorg.nl. It's a takeaway website. They accept Visa, Master, PayPal, American Express, Ideal, which is the local payment network in the Netherlands, and Bitcoin. So I ordered the largest pepperoni I can find on the internet. And I delivered it to a place that's in the middle of nowhere on an evening. Now, when you want to do an online order, you usually have to pay upfront. And to deliver pizza to Ter Appel, for, for the people who don't know where Ter Appel is, it's at the German borders, northern part of the country. They won't even deliver if you don't pay up front. And this was my way to get food for myself. Next day was beer, the day after was cola, cigarettes, and things started flowing in the camp. And the camp organizers, they were like astonished. Who is getting these things? They know refugees, they might have cash on them, but how are you delivering this cash for your goods and services? I started writing articles and reporters paying me in cryptos, paying me in Ethereum, paying me in Bitcoin, in Litecoin, in Monero, giving advice. I worked for Wikistrat. It's an online intelligence platform where intelligence agencies around the world they hire consultants and they pay them 400 euros in a day. You book your day for eight hours and you consult with experts. There is one day about Bitcoin blockchain. I made 400 euros in one day. I was king of the camp. <laughs> so I saw it, the use case for food, the use case for some personal luxury, but other refugees saw other things in it. They thought, well, we can send money to our families now. Because as a refugee, you are stripped of your identity. Nobody can verify who you are. Nobody can believe who you are. You are not financially included. And for my worst case, I don't have a birth certificate. I don't have a passport now. My bank accounts were closed. And I'm waiting for the government to give me a decision whether I can stay in the country or deport me back to Syria. So that technology really changed my life. But it was also an inspiration for another thing. I saw how many people like me did not have birth certificates because the war in Syria destroyed registries. <coughs> Academic certificates, birth certificates, death certificates, and land titles. My roommate in the room, in the camp, was a heart surgeon. 55 years old, he cannot prove that he's a heart surgeon. He had a faster process than me. Although I live in the country, I have a tax number, I have a social security number, I have a scooter, I have a dog, I have home, I have... I speak Dutch, and someone coming foreign to the country, they process him in three weeks, and I'm staying two years in a camp. I asked why. I didn't get an answer until I figured out that, yes, the, the process is paper-based, actually. You fill an application on paper. And I have my luck that my paper was at the end of the box. 
and I had to wait for all the applications to finish for mine to get processed. So paper-based systems, lack of interoperability, the Dutch immigration system cannot communicate to the Dutch municipality and check whether this registered tax number existed before, yes or no. And lots of fraud and lots of papers that are lost. So the decentralization of Bitcoin and the introduction of concepts like cryptography, decentralized key management systems, economic theories and incentives inspired me to start Tyken. Tyken is a social impact business that aims at giving back existence to people who have never existed before. 1.2 billion people around the world undocumented. Half of the world population is not financially included due to the lack of identities. 290 million children under the age of five do not have birth certificates. If my visa was denied because of birth certificate, I consider myself to be lucky to wait 25 years to make my dream come true and visit London. But those children are victims of now sex trafficking, child trafficking, child labor. And when people say, yeah, they do not get health care, they do not get education, that's the least of my worries. So at the end, we proved that this technology is not about hype as what people talk. It actually can bring hope. Thank you. Thank you, Tay. Thanks. Um, before I start asking you, as it were, set piece questions, I wonder if I can prompt you to say a little more. It's very unusual. Usually, I'm usually I'm asking people to stop because they run over time. You were exactly on time <laughs> until the second. So I'm going to ask you to expand a little no. bit. Tell us a little bit about um, uh, for the for the 50% of the people in the room who 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 aren't experts. Tell them how this technology, this this distributed as it were, ledger of instantly updated contracts. Just, just explain how that potentially solves the questions of, of stable and transferable and um, uh, validated identity. Yes. So what blockchain is about, actually, it's about uh, ledgers. And uh, my wife has a ledger on her table. Can you raise the black book? Uh, yeah, so just raise it up in the air. Yeah, that's a ledger. On ledgers, usually uh, you write your phone numbers, your names, email addresses. You have one in your hand, but what if you lose it? You lose all the data in it. What Bitcoin came to do is distribute these ledgers. But instead of revealing the actual information inside it, they use cryptography and cryptographic signatures that you own, you control, are publicly shown to the world. And because the nature of this distribution is done in a way that it cannot be changed, it, it has an immutability factor. So if we want to summarize what is Bitcoin and Bitcoin we say on a, there's two Bitcoins there's Bitcoin in a capital B and there is Bitcoin in a small b the Bitcoin in the capital B refers to the protocol to the technology and to what we know today as blockchain the Bitcoin in the small b refers to what currency or what token or what incentive does this chain has or this ledger has in order to keep it running and in that case the bitcoin blockchain if we want to summarize it in one word just remember the word i bond james bond i bond i bond represents immutable borderless open neutral and decentralized ledger we do not save names on it. We do not save addresses. We do not save phone numbers. We save a string, a cryptographic hash 
that represents a piece of data. And that piece of data could be your birth certificate, could be your land title, could be your first name. Nobody knows unless the owner of that key reveals it. So human beings have 10 fingerprints that are unique to him and that are different from any other fingerprint around the world. Digital files have the same characteristic. And digital files have digital fingerprints. We call them hashes. Any PDF file that you put in a SHA-256 generator gives you a hash, a unique hash that is irreversible. Every time, it's a one-way hash. Every time I take this PDF file and put it in this generator, that fingerprint will be generated. That, will, that fingerprint will be present. We take this fingerprint, we register, we register it on this immutable, borderless, open, neutral, decentralized ledger, and you have the blockchain. So imagine in 1990, the Kuwaiti government, when they issue birth certificates, they issue it on a blockchain system. That means the employee in my, in my seat, when I have someone in front of me, when I want to press the enter button and print out the paper for him, I would run it on a blockchain software that will take this fingerprint, put it on a blockchain, and give me the piece of paper with the QR code on it. Me, in a second life, as a validator of this document, whether I'm an embassy employee, a bank employee, or simply a person doing an interview for you for work, all I need to do is scan this QR code and check whether this digital fingerprint matches with what is on the blockchain. If there's a match, that means the document has not been tampered with at all. If there's no match, then I have the right to question the authenticity of this document. So, first question, and forgive me if this is an ignorant question. Presumably at some level, an, an, an old version of the world in which humans have data that is stored in, on paper yeah. and that may or may not be, have been falsified, serves as the originary data for some of what you've just described. Okay, which, so how do, we, how do we ensure that the things that are that are apparently unfalsifiable, apparently alterable every time somebody changes the whole system, weren't um, false to start with? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Today we cannot guarantee that, but what can guarantee that is a reputation. So let's take, in the case, LSE. What is the reputational damage if an employee at LSE gave extra credits to one, one student. And that student went, to, let's say, to, let's say he's an economist. He worked at the bank, and the bank figured out, hey, this person actually knows jack shit. And they would, go th they would do an exam for him, and they would figure out, hey, but this guy doesn't know anything. But his credentials, are on the blockchain and they state that Stefan actually has signed his degree. Stefan cannot go back and delete that signature. So it is giving accountability. I, t I, take, I, mean, I take the answer though, though, though I worry that there are quite a lot of people in senior positions in large investment banks who might once have given the same answer. True. And the, the, the thing here, uh, Stefan, is because this is public, this, is, this will not be erased in 10, 20, 50, 100 years. As long as the internet exists, these records will exist. The first Bitcoin transaction that happened in a day like today, October 31, 2009, 10 years from now, 10 years before, still is there on the network today. So if that transaction was involved in an illicit business, and they figure it out 30, 30 years later, the guy can get stuck. Okay. okay. So in a minute, I'm going to ask you to ask Tay questions. So start thinking about your perfectly apposite question. Um, I want to shift gears slightly and ask you something about um, the kind of politics of this, uh, the, the, 
the surrounding context for this technology. I'm old enough to remember when um, the internet revolution um, had more social promise than it had commercial promise. I'm old enough to remember when organizing the world's information okay, was a radical social project. Okay, I'm old enough to remember when Facebook was liberating okay, rather than constraining. So I wonder whether there are lessons that we need to have learned from the internet revolution, which went from, I, I simplify, but bear with me, every hippie's best fantasy to every hippie's worst nightmare in the space of a generation. Okay. How do we ensure that this promise, this, this um, open, distributed, authenticated, as it were, inclusive, um, uh, unfalsifiable, that's not I bond, but yep. <laughs> close enough, um, ledger works for public benefit rather than being captured, and in particular being captured by um, what you might call um, anti-state interests. Because there is a strong libertarian streak in some of these technology developments. Yeah. It's not an easy question, I apologize. No, 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 it's, uh, it's fine. Actually, um, I'm doing my master's in uh, digital currencies and blockchain technology. And this was one of the questions that I had to answer for my final was exam <laughs> two days ago. Okay. So, can to, st to start with, can states capture Bitcoin today? Yes, they can. They have the money, they have the politics, and they have the guns to do that. The most concentration of Bitcoin mining is in China. Simply, the Chinese government can pull out its guns, capture all the miners, and force them to mine or to write a different ledger, a different future than this distributed computers are writing today. So what can we do to ensure that Bitcoin and blockchain technology, and when I say Bitcoin, I am referring to this technology and not to the specific use of it as a currency. So just keep that in mind. Because I hate to mix Bitcoin and blockchain together. It's unfair. What can we ensure to make sure that this technology will not be delivering other promises than what we see today? Lamborghinis, parties and people who were like me calling in the early days for inclusion, calling for helping each other, calling for the 1.2 billion people who do not have identities, who are not financially included, and today we see them that they have left that, that, that mission. That is, in my opinion, a personal problem. And this is the problem of people who have not lived the situation, people who have not lived in refugee camps, people who were not from that environment of being a person living without a bank account for two years, being forced into certain things that it, was not, it, it is not out of his hand. Education can help. Education on the sense, what is this technology? What can it do? Using it can help. Doing meetups and doing these things is very important in raising awareness. And raising a new generation of entrepreneurs telling them that you can do what you want. Today, you can have your own bank. If you're 12, 13, 14 years old, do not wait until you're 18 to get your first bank account and be financially included. If you have a skill, if you're a woman in Afghanistan, if you're a woman in Nigeria, if you're a woman in Saudi Arabia, 
you are forced to be dependent on the man of the family. Don't do that. Everybody has a smartphone today. Download the Bitcoin wallet. Take your talents online. Do t-shirts. Make soap. My wife likes to make soap. She sells soap for Bitcoin. I know some women in Saudi Arabia, they, they're making hand bracelets. They're selling it for Bitcoin. There is projects in Afghanistan where Bitcoin donations are helping in financing sewing machines, designing dresses, curtains, tablecloth. This is what we want to hear about. It is very small initiatives, but they will grow. Is, is the sizable torrent of anti-cryptocurrency opinion with some very famous spokespeople, yeah. is that special pleading by vested interests or is it uh, another answer to the we have to be careful what we wish for problem? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's more probably of ignorance. Uh, they might have their own agendas. They might be uh, influenced from banks and politics. I mean, I said it today on my LinkedIn on the post that I was coming to speak at LSE. Living in Lebanon gave me a perspective on money. Money always influenced politics. Always. Even in England. Netherlands. All around the world. Money is forcing politics to do bad things. The war in Syria is all about money. Every war that I've at least witnessed in my life, living in Lebanon, was about money. And today, money is freed. Money is freed from centralized institutions. We can make money at our own homes. We can be banks at our own homes. And this, like, can, imagine being your own bank in your bedroom. I mean, this, this is out of the size of the human brain. No one ever thought that one day will come and we will walk with banks in our pockets. Barack Obama said it. So when uh, we hear on Twitter these anti-crypto guys talking, I doubt that he has used the Bitcoin in his life or it, any type of currency. But it isn't just on Twitter. It's the heads of large institutions True. who I suspect have business models to protect. True. Questions from you for Tay. Tell us, tell us who you are. Um, Hi, I'm Gayatri, a student at the LSE. Um, really inspirational story. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you quite a journey that you've come through. Uh, so my question's a little bit more about when you were explaining how to use blockchain technology to build identities for people, but anonymous identities that can't necessarily be um, fraudulent, right? And it's related to um, the system in India right now, which is called Aadhaar. And so there's a big push on digital identity and how to get you know, digital identity access to even the most illiterate, remote regions of different countries. And India was able to onboard some 97% of their population, which is yeah. fantastic. But now there's a bit more of criticism around it, right? Identities being stolen, fraud happening. So my question is, how, how do you scale blockchain technology at a scale that India is trying to achieve? Why would governments be hesitant to use it? Um, and just, you know, what's required to be able to do that? Nice. Might be worth just explaining, the, unless, in case not sure. everyone knows. Yeah. I'm just noting here, number three, that there's three points. Point number one, for the guys who, and the ladies who do not know what is Adhar, it's a, similar to my story in Kuwait, the Indian government decided to do the same thing. Let's gather all the Indian population data, First name, last name, addresses, but let's add something new to it. Fingerprints and iris scans. And we put them in all in one place. And we give the trust to one guy or one office and we tell him, you protect this data. What do you think will happen next day? You will find this data on eBay sold for 20 and 30 and 40 and 50 euros. 
If someone's interested, I can personally deliver for you an Excel sheet of addresses in India with iris scans and fingerprints. Data today is gold. It can be misused, and history has proven that. World War II, nobody questions how was the prosecution against the Jewish communities committed. What was the tool? Anybody know what is the punch card machine? Punch card was the tool that the German government or the Nazi government used to register people in the Netherlands. It's a technology. It was a great technology. The purpose of the punch card was to deliver social services for the Dutch and the Belgian societies. Deliver healthcare, deliver mail, telephone lines, a detailed address system. Someone, a fuse popped in his head and he decided to pinpoint every single Jewish person on that ledger. And not only that, go back in history and check their bloodlines even. So if a German married a Jew, we know where did this happen, where do they live now, who are their grandchildren. And the rest, we all know what happened. What is blockchain coming to say today? Instead of the government or Facebook owning this data, and we like and share posts that the data is leaked, and we are actually, we don't have power on that anymore, we're saying, let's build identities on a new concept called self-sovereignty. So one of the homework that I would like to give you today is when we finish this event, Google an article called self, the principles, the 10, 10 principles of self-sovereign identities. It's a concept introduced in 2014 that explains how to build digital identities based on self-sovereignty. One of these 10 principles is consent on sharing data and building a digital identity with privacy. We are happy that the European Union today is actually calling for privacy and they issued the GDPR law. When I landed today in London, I had to fill in this foreigner's card. On the back side of the card, there is a note on GDPR. Why? Because governments and big institutions, they are pushing back this ownership of the data back to the citizens. They don't want to take responsibility anymore on controlling and saving this data. Will blockchain help tomorrow, next week, next year, next three to five years? No. But does it mean that we sit at home and do nothing? Also no. We have to test. We have to start from a very small scale. Start maybe with a library application of a library card a proof of age app where you can buy alcohol without revealing your age. Today, when we buy alcohol, you have to show your whole driving license. But with combining blockchain with emerging technologies, let's say like decentralized identifiers, which is an emerging technology protocol from the W3C, you are able to build an application that your age, your date of birth, is verified from a municipality or a school in a way that preserves your privacy so that when you are at a liquor shop, all what you need to do is tap your phone with the phone of the vendor at the, uh, at, at the shop, and it will show him that this owner of the phone is actually plus 18. How do we know that this is the owner? Because you're using your fingerprint to unlock the phone. Now, yes, you can chop my fingerprint, you can register your finger, fingerprints, uh, friend. We've heard these uh, counter arguments. They, there is ways around it. I will bear this in mind when next time I'm asked if I'm 18. <laughs> yes, sir. 
I thought I'd talk loudly. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, my name is Dennis again. Uh, um, I do some social impact stuff with NGOs and, and uh, uh, local authorities mostly here in the UK, uh, sometimes outside as well. I'm originally from the Netherlands. Uh, the, um, uh, so my, my biggest problem in, in reality is sometimes not the technology, but the, and you touched upon it, is the behavioral science uh, that goes with it. How do you get people to, to embrace that? There are about one million people without any bank accounts in the UK at the moment. Um, and there are different tools and techniques and cards, etc., that they can apply for, but they don't really. Uh, because it's all a little bit scary and where does my money actually go and all that. Cool. In, in your experience, what nudges, what ways have you found uh, to get people in refugee camps to, to embrace this? Good question. Mm. Yes. By showing stuff, by showing that this works. And I would say we started from a very simple user experience, user interface, UX, UI. And this is what the technology is missing today, besides education. UX, UI is a very important catalyst for adoption of blockchain technology and cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. So when we say... Not everyone will know what UX, UI means. You UX, UI is user experience and user interfaces. Thank you. So, Sorry to interrupt. I just no problem. wanted to make sure yeah. everyone was... Everyone yeah. So how, how putting yourself in the shoes... Let's go take it one step back. Why did Titan succeed today? Why did this startup that started a year ago today is sitting on the same table with World Bank, with Iraqi government, with Dutch government? Two times we had meetings with the Dutch royals. Why? Why, why is this happening? Because we understand the journey of refugees. I'm a refugee myself. I know the loopholes, I know all the small nitty details, and this is called user experience. How does a user feel when I'm presenting this technology for him? Skin color plays a role, because when I'm using a face recognition application, if I'm in Africa and I have maybe thick fingers, or if I have or for my fingerprints are, are uh, like are weird away or it's the sunlight can give an effect on the mobile app and it can give effect on the reflection. So all these small details, they, they help. And I would say, make your hands dirty. Wear the boots, go down and work with the target people that you are going through. So if we are going to build a crypto app or a blockchain app for homeless people in London, let's say, you have to be a homeless guy in London. You have to know where they sleep, where they eat. You have at least to live it for two or three days. And then you will find out that small hook where you can uh, get your solution out. Education is another thing. And looking at the correct type of blockchain. In many cases, blockchain is not needed for the solutions we want to we want to actually, for the problems that we are going to bring solutions in. And this is also one big uh, thing that, that we've seen in the, uh, in the community uh, today. Here at the front. Hi, uh, my name is Livia Wittermore, and I'm studying international migration and public policy at LSE. Um, I was really intrigued by what you were talking about, um, about identifying people based on a blockchain system, and I wanted to know um, how much is this actually in use among especially special immigrant visa holders applying for residence in the U.S.? Do you have any particular data on um, the use of this particular technology? Yes. I can give you two examples. First example is from a, actually a company in London called Evernim. Uh, they worked with the city of Utah in the, in the United States on building a birth birth certificate registration system that leverages uh, Sovereign, which is a, a type of a blockchain. It's more a little bit specifically a distributed ledger. Uh, there is an initiative between ca the Canadian government, the Dutch Ministry of Justice, 
and KLM, the uh, the airline, uh, on a new project called Know Your Traveler. Travelers can go travel with their finger, uh, with their thumb. You book your flight, you book your hotel, you check in from the Dutch airport, you check out in the uh, you check out from the Dutch airport, you check in in the Canadian airport, all using your fingerprint. And it was launched at the World Economic Forum in the beginning of this year. What we are working on is together with the Dutch Red Cross. And this is maybe, uh, Stefan, also an answer for your first question on how do you, you know, how do we know that the data is, what is registered on the blockchain is actually correct or authentic. So bl blockchain does not clean the data, does not make it authentic. If you register garbage, you get garbage. In our case, with the Dutch Red Cross, we leverage their trust, we leverage their reputation in letting them issue a digital identity for the people of the island of St. Martin. The island of St. Martin is, was hit by hurricane, hurricane uh, two years ago, and it's a repetitive cycle today. Every two years there is a hurricane, and they have to come in the island and identify people. So together we are uh, working on bringing a digital identity platform so that the Dutch Red Cross can register people who need help one time only and not make it repetitive, leveraging the sovereign uh, solution or the sovereign blockchain. Again, is it scalable? Will it, uh, will it allow people to vote, to travel, to open bank accounts? Not yet. You need partners for that, and you need the adoption of the governments, of other third parties, but we believe, since we're working with a trusted organization like Red Cross, there might be a chance that the government can sign on that data also and transform that identity from an aid-receiving identity into a digital passport or a digital voting pass or a, access, or a way to access bank accounts. Uh, you, you know, go on, go on, go on. We've got time, but you have to be very brief because there, there are some questions. Just quickly, um, so what does that do for things like Dublin Agreement that are having people stop in the country they first arrive in? Does this mean that with your technology, more refugees are likely to be stopped in their first place of arrival? Could be. Okay. Uh, yeah, that is, uh, that, that is possible. And... If you ask my personal opinion, I'm not a fan of refugees crossing oceans and walking thousands of kilometers to come ask for asylum. That's stupid. There is embassies around the world, for the Netherlands in particular, where refugees can simply go and apply for an application there. Instead of a refugee paying 10,000 euros to take a boat and risk his life, to come to a country, he can simply do an application in, in the embassy. That's more of a political choice not to make that, that happen. Uh, I think first, behind you in... Uh, first to the back and then on the front row over there. Uh, sorry, my name's James and I'm, I'm here because I was just interested in your story. I guess I got two questions. You talked about money corrupting politics but can you say that money corrupts people? So is there a real fear around the fact that people would use their influence to alter the validation in terms of the self-sovereignty of, of, of their identity? Mm. And I guess the second question is, and this is probably an ignorant one on um, sort of Bitcoin, I've read that people have, because they're the key to their information, um, if they've lost that password or, or the access to that, you know, they lose all their data. So, you know, how does this affect you in terms of, or how does this affect someone in terms of their, their self-sovereign um, identity? You know, if they pass away or they forget, you know, their, their access pass or anything like that. And uh, to answer this quickly, as I said before, there is limitations today for the technology, but that will not prevent us from creating business models around them 
and selling those uh, solutions. I personally have a wallet with 77 bitcoins that I lost the key entry for it. I can look at it, but I cannot transfer coins from it. And this was like since six years now. So I gave up hope. <laughs> Same thing for identity can happen. You can lose your password today. You call, you send an email to Google or you send an email to, to the operator and they will give you a reset link. Since blockchain is a decentralized distributed technology, there is no one actually to call. So here there is some cryptographic concepts like let's say Shamir secret sharing where a key is broken into pieces, shared with your friends, shared with a trusted institution, one with yourself. Once these three secrets come together, you can recover your key. You can perhaps a trusted institution can be the guardian of your key in case something happens, you can contact it. To answer your first question, yes, you can, a government can be corrupted or a person in a government can be corrupted and start issue fake identities. The public nature of the technology will let us see that. And in blockchains, we have three basic types today. You have a permissionless, where anyone can participate and no one has authority on the governance model of this blockchain. You have a permissioned ledger, where a group of companies or group of people come together and say, we will set the rules of this network. And if someone misbehaves, we will kick him out. And you have an organization running its own blockchain. In the first one, in the permissionless, which is like Bitcoin, Ethereum, that problem doesn't exist because everybody is equal, everybody has decision on the network. But to do an upgrade or to change something is very difficult because you need the approval of everyone. And we saw this today in scaling up Bitcoin. When we wanted to bring Bitcoin from a one megabyte data block into more, Suddenly, we saw the chain splitting, Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin Gold, and all these things. Sovereign is a type of a permissioned ledger. So if someone is corrupt in this ledger, we are all, all able to see that and we can uh, kick him out. Yeah, from there. Um, hi, uh, I'm, a, I'm Tong. I'm a master student of the School of Public Policy. So my question is kind of similar to the previous one, because my understanding of the technology is it's a public, public ledger that records whatever happens and nobody can tamper the data. So if it has been applied widely, can the corruption of government go away? Corruption of governments will never go away. <laughs> but if we can use, use the technology to hold them more accountable? Definitely. You can hold them more accountable. That's, that's, that's the purpose of it. Yeah. Will they use it? In my opinion, not. Because that's a business model of a government. Okay, so the question will become, if they use it, they, yes. corruption will go away. But the issue is we can't make, convince them to widely apply yes. it. Yes, yes. Okay. So what we can do is we can do Trojan horses. So we come to the government, and that's the strategy that we use. And we tell them, yeah, we're going to design a blockchain that's specific for you with your own rules and your own things. And slowly, slowly, we do small doses of Bitcoin and Ethereum and all these permissionless technologies. Some of them, they like it. Not all governments have corruption in their business model. But, I mean, if we look back at the internet, we did not see Facebook coming. We did not see Twitter coming. We did not see Instagram coming. And no one can see what Bitcoin will do. We're nearly out of time, so I want to see whether I can wrap up with any final questions. Who is asking? One, is that the last question? Okay. 
So. What, what, I think you may have a answered this already in some of the other responses you gave. But what is, over the next 12 to 24 months, what's your biggest hurdle? What are the two biggest problems you have to overcome to deploy the applications? Yeah. I would say lack of talent, number one. So the uh, space today does not have talented developers, talented architects, um, lobbyists, economists. That is one big hurdle. Second hurdle is education. We, when we talk to in our target market NGOs and governments, like we're talking east and west, it's 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 a. With all my respect to to Stefan, but there's lots of old people who are having <laughs> big, big, big positions who have problems in setting up a Gmail account creating a Facebook page, and now I'm coming to tell them, yeah, we're going to build this help solve an identity system for you. I mean, it's, I'm realistic, and these are the, uh, the challenges. And the last one, I would say, uh, funding. Um, after all this uh, ICO hypes and all the cryptocurrency crashes that, that we saw, there has been some lost faith in the technology. But that won't stop us from building what we believe in. Thank you. Um, so I'm not going to attempt to summarize everything you've told <laughs> us, um, uh, except that I'm delighted that I now know how to prove that I'm over 18. Um, <laughs> but I am going to pick out a couple of things that you've said that I think are worth um, dwelling on or worth remembering. Um, I was very powerfully impressed by this notion that you have to have lived in the community whom you claim to speak for. Yes. This idea that solutions are not technocratic and they're not distant and they can't be deployed without um, lived experience, I think is fantastically important for all entrepreneurs um, and particularly um, entrepreneurs who claim to be speaking for the flourishing of True. humankind. I was incredibly impressed by this notion that um, um, solutions are always a combination of, as it were, behavior change and technolo technological possibility. Um, you mentioned several times, though you didn't major on it, um, the idea that um, these things are systems. You can't solve problems without bringing together private and public sector, yes. governments and corporations, technology and behavior. I think that's a, that's a, that's a, um, that, that was a very powerful message for me. Um, uh, the word inspiring is overused, I think, um, uh, but I was genuinely inspired Thank you. by the direction that you are nudging us in to think more deeply and more profoundly and more connectedly uh, about the possibilities that these technologies Thank you. appear. And it gladdens my heart that there is a technology solution being explicitly purposed um, for public benefit rather than private capture. Um, and it's difficult to imagine how we might have had this conversation 15 years ago, I think, because the, and I think the world has moved on in a in a better direction. And you and those people you work with are largely to thank for thank that. You. So uh, I, I really am genuinely pleased that you came over so from much. the Netherlands uh, to um, help us with these questions. I'm very grateful to you for asking smart questions and for giving up uh, a chunk of your Tuesday evening. Um, thank you, Tay. Thank you so much. Thanks.